how networks can accept a variety of different data inputs. That's one of their true powers compared to other model types that you might have seen before. Other model types like support vector machines, random forest, you are typically taking in a one-dimensional array vector. So you have a series of features in one flat array that is going into the model for predictions. In a neural network, this can be a two-dimensional array. And what's important about the way that this two-dimensional array typically goes into the neural network is that it is the, the locations on the array, if they're close to each other, they're considered together. So this is very useful when the array is an image, but it doesn't necessarily have to be an image. Array is going to be a basically usually three deep for red, green, and blue. And this is going to be a fully colored image. You can also go much, much higher dimensions if you so desire. Now I'm calling these arrays or matrices, but they're also known as tensors. A tensor is just a multi-dimensional array. Other model types that you've seen like random forest, support vector machines, and the others, they typically are either classification or regression. Neural networks can be both of these at the same time or something entirely different. Large language models like ChatGPT, which you've probably seen a lot of just in the last, last few months, is a, it takes text in and it it puts text out, so that would be neither a classification nor a regression type of a neural network. However, if you are dealing with classic type data where you're going to have a 1D array coming into this, you might have age, income, weight, and then some lab tests. I'm using a life insurance example where you would then figure out the, the maximum policy that you would issue this person based on their, their input criteria. That would be regression because what's coming out of the neural network is a number. You can also do a classification neural network. This is where you have age, income, weight, and the various lab values going into the hidden neurons, just like before, and you're getting out a class. So what type of a risk is this person? Are they preferred, standard, substandard, or are we going to decline them altogether? You also see I put a bias neuron here. We're going to see more about those in just a moment. So building these neural networks, whether they are simple regression and classification or something that takes images or text or other, other more advanced things, you're going to have this same basic structure repeating. You're going to have the input neurons, input one, two, three. Inputs are going into some sort of a neuron on the next layer, usually a hidden neuron or the ultimate output neuron or one of the output neurons. So what is essentially happening here is the, each of these inputs is being multiplied by the weights and then added together. So it's a weighted sum. And this goes into the next the next neuron where it's summed together. And then an activation function is applied to it. The activation function provides nonlinearity to this. It's There's a whole variety of them that we're going to see in, in just a moment and why we choose some of the ones that we do. And then finally, the output. This could be the output from the neural network, or this could be just output to the next layer. I show the formula here. Again, it's basically just a weighted sum, and you're passing that weighted sum to the ultimate activation function. And this is how you calculate individual neurons beyond the input neurons in the neural network. Now there's a variety of types of neurons that you'll see. And I'm, I'm giving some of them here. There's, there's definitely other types beyond this as we get into time series and convolution and other, other things like that. You have the input neurons. That is where the input tensor, which might be just a one-dimensional vector or it might be something higher dimension, that's where that is coming into your neural network. The hidden neurons are what occur just after the input and those do the actual processing and calculations on recognizing what is coming into the input. And then finally, they go to the output layer where they 
they go off to the rest of the program that your neural network is embedded into. And then there's also bias neurons. Bias neurons occur really on the, as the input layer goes to the first hidden layer and then the second hidden layer and so on, uh, the output layer itself does not actually usually have a bias neuron. If you think back to slope intercept form like you had in an algebra class, the bias is the intercept, and we'll see that in a moment, whereas the weights are closer to the slope. These are put into layers. You have an input layer, output layer, and then the hidden layers. This is what a typical neural network would look like. You can see the bias neurons that we have here. Often the bias is treated as an input, simply hard-coded to one, so that it's really just a weight. And it they connect to, to the next layer and pass through the activation functions, all of these together. These are densely connected layers because they are they are fully fully connected to the next layer. Dense layers are very important for really calculating the computation and, and recognition. This has two hidden layers with the bias neurons finally flowing to the output. So you can see there is no bias neuron in the output layer. Why are bias neurons needed? We plot the graph of this basic function, which is essentially an activation function, but we're, we're passing in the sigmoid activation function to be precise, but we're passing in the, an x value, which is the x axis. So as we, as we change these values and then the weight and the bias. So this first one is showing where we're varying the weight. And as we, as we vary that weight on these different lines, you can see we're varying the slope. The, the weight really corresponds to the slope when you put something into slope intercept form. When we vary the bias, you can see that it's shifting it. And the bias really allows various inputs to actually produce something zero or near zero as you adjust it. And that's just one of the many uses. Overall, we're just shifting and kind of contorting these outputs from the various nonlinear activation functions so that we're able to approximate functions. And then we're adding many, many of these together and they become the inputs into the subsequent layers. Modern activation functions. The rectified linear unit, you will see that a lot on modern neural networks and variants of it, like the leaky rectified linear unit. We'll see it in a moment. Softmax and linear are then the two that you put on the non-hidden neurons, so like the, the output layer. The linear activation function is really almost no activation function at all. It's simply a straight pass-through. This is done for regression neural networks on the final layer when you're wanting to output a number. So you don't want to constrain it to some range of numbers. The rectified linear unit, very popular for hidden layers in, in current. It, this was very much part of the whole revolution of deep learning. It is essentially taking taking the max of zero and x, as you, as you can see here. When we look at the derivatives of these, you will see why that is a, a very popular one. Compared to the sigmoid, and hyperbolic tangent that were previously very popular before the deep learning sort of era. The softmax, you can see its function here. What it's basically doing is, if we look back up at my classification, which one of these output neurons would it actually be? Whichever one has the largest value is what we say that the neural network has chosen to as, as the class that it actually is. So if decline had the highest value and these others were lower, we would say that it, it had chosen decline as the class. Those numbers could be anything, and we would like them to add up to 1.0 so that, say, this one was 0.7. You could say it's 70% 7 probability, and then these others would probably add up to 30. So that's that's the purpose of the softmax activation function. It ensures that on a classification neural network that all these classes add up to a probability of 1 or 100%. And I provide some sample calculations of the of the softmax. 
The step activation function is if you kind of like a toggle switch, anything below it is going to be, anything below zero is going to be zero, anything above zero is going to be one. Sigmoid and hyperbolic tangent activation functions, those were used a lot more in older generation neural networks and the hidden layers. You still see the softmax on LSTM models as well as the step. But these are both S-shaped, and it's like that they kind of taper off to zero in both directions. The main difference between sigmoid and hyper, hyperbolic tangent is just the it's just the possible y values that can come out of those between zero and and one for sigmoid, and they're both kind of S-shaped, and between negative one and one for the hyperbolic tangent. This has nothing to do with trig. It was chosen simply because it has an S-type shape. Why rectify linear unit is so popular? It's the vanishing gradients problem. And what is a gradient? A gradient is the derivative, each individual weight, a partial derivative of the weights at one particular value of the weight. So what this is showing is as I change this one particular value of the weight, the error goes up and it goes down. Ideally, you would like the error to go down to zero. Hopefully that's near a global minimum, but that could be a local minimum. We'll, we'll see more about that as we get into some of the, the optimization. But these are the local minima that you hear about that it could be trapped in. You don't know off the graph. Maybe this goes way down to, to here, to close to a zero error. What you do is you can only really see what the error is at the current value of the weight. If you could see this whole graph, that would be great. You just you just pick the, the lowest point. But since you only have access to this value, you take the derivative, the partial derivative, at that weight, and you look at the slope of the derivative there, which is called the gradient. This slope is is a negative slope. So you're going to take the opposite of that and add to the weight. So you're going to you're going to increment the weight since it is a a negative value slope. If it were a positive slope, it would be more pointing in in that direction. So if you look at the sigmoid function and then the derivative, you can see that as you get away from the origin, 0, it it goes off to 0. And that is the vanishing gradient problem. As you have these gradients go off to zero, potentially, you have entire neurons shutting down and no longer being able to be trained. The slope of the rectified linear unit does not have that vanishing gradient issue as they don't they don't taper off immediately to zero. Thanks for watching the video and please subscribe to the channel to keep up with the course and other projects that I do in artificial intelligence. And if this video was useful, please give me a like. Thank you very much. And if you have questions or want to discuss anything, hit the comments.